later. Okay, so let's talk about Legolas. Legolas is uh, the elf representative in the Fellowship of the Ring. What they tried to do, what Elrond and Gandalf tried to do, was make sure that the... Um, the Fellowship represented all of the free peoples of Middle-earth, and so they wanted an elf, and the elf they chose was Legolas. We'll have a um, a little look later about exactly why that might have been that they chose him, not somebody else. Um, but uh, in terms of his history, we genuinely don't know when Legolas was born. They came up with a, an age for the films, uh, but that is just a sort of a guess. We uh, know where he came from. He was a prince of Mirkwood. Um, the, the Mirkwood elves, the, the Greenwood elves as they were originally, they were quite a mixed bunch. But if we go back a couple of generations to understand where Legolas came from, his grandfather was a guy called Odifer. Odifer lived in um, Dorian in the First Age. Dorian was a uh, an intriguing little bit of First Age Middle Earth because the elves were very divided at that time. It has to be said. Some of the elves had gone over. Uh, to the west. Some of them had seen the light of the two trees, some of them had not. In, in, in Doriath we have um, elves who are, are kind of mixed, because the leadership had seen the light of the two trees. They were light elves. Their leader was Thingol. He had been across, he had come back. Uh, Thingol's wife was Melian the Maya, uh, Amaya, she had obviously been over to uh, the Undying Lands. Oh, in fact, she'd come from the uh, Undying Lands. And their influence made Doriath, and in particular Menegroth, their capital, the most beautiful capital that, uh, the be most beautiful city that Middle Earth had ever seen. Uh, that's the way that Tolkien describes it. The, the Thousand Caves were carved out by dwarves, decorated by elves, inspired by the Maya. This was incredible beauty. They were led by light elves who had seen the light of the two trees, um, but the majority of the people who lived there were, um, I mean, technically dark elves. They had not seen the light of the two trees. However, they had the majority of them, they had travelled across looking for it, but had stayed behind. They had answered the the call from the Valar, but for a variety of reasons, some of them good, some of them not so good, they had just not made it all the way. So we have this area which is the closest we probably get in Middle-earth in the First Age to the Undying Lands, and that is where Odifer was. And Odifer was almost certainly a member of the aristocracy here. However, um, Menegroth uh, Thingol fell to disaster. If you've ever read The Silmarillion, you'll know the First Age was just basically a series of disasters for the elves. The, the, the fall of Thingol and the fall of Menegroth happened over many years through treachery, through betrayal, through um, kinslaying elves attacking elves, through dwarves attacking elves, eventually it fell. All of this happened and the big bad at the time, um, the uh, Melkor Morgoth didn't actually have to do all that much. The, the elves themselves turned and the whole thing collapsed. Some escaped, though. One of these was Odifer. Odifer heads out and he heads east. East. The, um, the whole of Middle-earth, that part of Middle-earth, was then consumed in a huge war. The wrath of the Valar um, came across, took out Melkor and Morgoth, um, and some escaped over to the east. And Odifer was one of them. And then um, he 
some point in the second age, around 750, I believe it was, he became king of Greenwood the Great, this fantastic um, forest, beautiful forest. He wanted to return to what it was that made elves what they were, the, the, the forest land. Um, but also he wanted to capture or recapture a little bit of of what Menegoth had, that beauty in the caves. And so he carved out, or he had his people carve out this wonderful city, this cave system underneath uh, or in the hills of the forest. And it was not as great or as beautiful or as wonderful as the, the thing it was based on, but it was still very, very good. Orifa then um, ruled for a while until at the end of the Second Age we get the last alliance of elves and men, and he joined. He joined this last alliance of elves and men against Sauron. This, for fans of the Rings of Power, this will be coming up, I'm sure, in Season 5 or something like that. The elves and the men joined together to try, finally, to defeat Sauron, and they push Sauron all the way back to Mordor. Orifer and the uh, the elves from Mirkwood, or wasn't called Mirkwood at the time, from Greenwood the Great, uh, they were there and they were raring to go. They weren't as well armoured as perhaps the elves elsewhere, but they were quite self-assured. They, they knew that they were good and they weren't going to wait for battle orders. Orifer decided, you know what, we'll just go in, we'll take on some orcs, it'll be fine, let's not worry about what Gilgalad or anyone like that says, we'll just head on in there, and we'll just take out a whole load of the enemy. They went in, and what happened was a disaster. Um, they, uh, they go into a swampland, a bogland, and... 75% of the elves die. They kill a lot of orcs, to be fair to them, but it, it is a horrendous battle. Huge amounts of them die. Now, besides this, the siege goes on, Sauron comes out. We know that scene from the very beginning of the films when uh, how Sauron's finally defeated and Isildur cuts the ring from his finger. We know all of that bit. But as far as Orifer and the elves from Greenwood the Great are concerned, this is a Pyrrhic victory. They have lost so many of their people. Orifer himself dies. His son, Thranduil, clearly traumatized by this battle, leads his people back up to Greenwood. And just focuses in on his own kingdom. He he doesn't look elsewhere. He doesn't engage with anyone elsewhere for hundreds, for thousands of years. During this time, Greenwood the Great, when we move on into the Third Age, Greenwood the Great suddenly starts getting infected by some kind of evil. It starts, people start calling it Mirkwood. It used to be beautiful and green and leafy, but now something bad is going on in the south of Mirkwood. And Thranduil, this is Legolas's father, he slowly retreats north and north and north. He doesn't he doesn't engage with whatever this is that's going on in the south of his kingdom. He just retreats to smaller and smaller and smaller areas. Somewhere in this le time, Legolas is born, probably in this third age, probably in this slow retreat from the south of Mirkwood. We know now, looking back, that this darkness, this shadow that turns Greenwood the Great to Mirkwood, that was Sauron, who had, um, uh, without physical form, set himself up in Dol Guldur in the south of Mirkwood, and that's where the darkness was spreading from. But Thranduil just did not want. He he had the uh, the equivalent of uh, post traumatic stress um, uh, disorder. He he didn't even want to look south because of the memories of what had happened to him all that time ago. That is the atmosphere that 
Nicholas grew up in. He was Thranduil's son and heir, which makes it sound right quite dark and bleak and gloomy. But actually, Thranduil had a really happy court. He had a, he, it was almost as if he's going, la, 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 la. There might be bad things happening in the south of the forest. I'm not listening. When you read The Hobbit and you read about the Elven King, that's Thranduil. That's Legolas's father. And what's happening to them? They're having feasts out in the forest. They have a feast out in the forest. They move around feasts. They, um, have this uh, business importing wine and butter and wonders uh, from uh, the, the outside world. They are enjoying life. They are happy. They get drunk. That's the atmosphere that Legolas grows up in. And he thinks to himself, someday perhaps I will inherit this. So that's the early life. Of Legolas, and we don't get a single mention of him at any point until the Lord of the Rings. Now, this is probably realistically because Tolkien wrote The Hobbit first and then The Lord of the Rings later. And when we got to The Lord of the Rings, he wanted to have an elf character, and so he then invented Legolas. But it was too late to then retrofit Legolas into The Hobbit, he was there, but. Uh, he doesn't get mentioned. So the first time we hear about Legolas is when he gets sent to Elrond. The reason he gets sent to Elrond is because um, in the lead up to the War of the Ring, the sort of, sort of the precursor to off page, the stuff we we don't actually read about per se in the Lord of the Rings, but things that happened just before the story. Gandalf had spent a long time hunting for uh, Gollum and eventually they find him and they quiz him about what's going on. Gollum doesn't really want to talk. Um, Aragorn ties him up and drags him all the way up to Mirkwood. He questions him and eventually they leave him a prisoner there in Mirkwood. Thranduil's prisoner. But Gollum escapes. Uh, the where the blame lies for this, I don't know, you could put it either way. The elves are very clear. Legolas makes it very clear at the Council of Elrond because he gets sent across to the Council of Elrond to admit hmm, Gollum escaped. Um, he makes it very clear it's not our fault. There was a there was an orc raid. This this happened, um, but Gollum escaped. Legolas is sent to Elrond to let him know. Just you know. Gollum's back out there, and Legolas gets caught up in the Council of Elrond. He didn't go there for the Council of Elrond. The Council of Elrond happened, and through Tolkienian fate, he was there as long as, as well as the uh, representatives from the dwarves, as well as the representatives from humans, uh, as well as the representatives from uh, the hobbits. And he doesn't say much during the Council of Elrond. He he says his tale. He says, yeah, we had uh, Gollum, then he escaped, and now I've come here to tell you about it. And that's pretty much it. But he gets selected to become a member of the Fellowship. And almost certainly this is because he's an elf. He um, Elrond and uh, Gandalf, when thinking about who should be there, Elrond is the person who picks the team. Um, it's we have Frodo, Sam's obviously going along with him, uh, Gandalf's obviously going, going along, uh, Aragorn is obviously going along. Boromir says, Yeah, or if you're going my direction, I'll go that way too. And then he thinks, Well, we might as well have an elf and a dwarf because we've got elves and we've got dwarves, so let's make this representative. And so that's how Legolas gets in. It doesn't appear to be, oh, well, we definitely need to have Legolas in there. It's just that he happens to be there. 
But they set off, and Legolas clearly has skills that are very, very useful. His eyesight throughout the story, um, he can see so much further than anyone else in the Fellowship. That is a hugely important thing. Several times he can see things up in the sky that others can't see. Uh, when much later we have the three hunters, Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas are hunting orcs, he can see where the orcs are, where, even though when they're miles away over the plains. Um, his eyesight, his senses are very, very important. He is, um, uh, e even when they're trying to go over Caradras, uh, when the snows come in, he, he can walk, run over the snow. That's how light-footed he is. Um, so that's what he seems to add to the fellowship added to which he's got a range attack in a way that uh, the rest of them don't aragorn's very much sword gimli's he's got his axe um boromir is also close combat gandalf can do a variety of things obviously but if you're looking for the ranged weapon then it's legolas so he adds things um to what the fellowship can uh, do and achieve now, we next see him when he's, um, I mean, he, he says a few things, uh, obviously, during the, uh, the trip, but he does, he's, he's actually a lot quieter in the books than he is on the, uh, in the films. Um, there's a vote, they have a vote before they go into Moria, and he simply says, I do not wish to go into Moria, but he accepts the will of the leaders. He probably of all of the fellowship is the person he, he will say what he thinks, but he accepts what the leader says more than anyone else. When they're in Moria, he is the first to recognize what the Balrog is. The Balrog is following. They know some big, bad, nasty, gribbly thing is following them. He is the first for the first to say it's a Balrog and he is scared. This is the only time, incidentally, that we ever see Legolas scared. He is scared of the Balrog because the elves obviously have long memory and they know what the Balrogs were like back in the first age. Because this isn't just a, a thing which uh, back in the mists of time happened for elves. This is something that their fathers or their grandfathers remember. This is something very real to them. So he recognizes the Belrog. He is scared, but they escape. And he, when Aragorn says, let's go to Lothlorien, he's excited. Because it turns out that the elves of Mirkwood have not, despite the fact they're very close, Mirkwood and uh, Lothlorien, they've not really talked to each other and you would have thought if anyone Legolas being the king's son he would have perhaps ventured out to Lothlorien but no such was the introverted nature the inward looking nature of the elves of Mirkwood that Legolas had never even been to Lothlorien they know who he is uh, he introduces himself, um, they get to the, the edges of Lothlorien, and um, the elves there talk to him, for understandable reasons. And we get this rather amusing little um, exchange when uh, they say, okay, so you can all proceed, that's absolutely fine, but we're going to have to blindfold the dwarf, I'm sorry never trust a dwarf a dwarf so uh gimli then is like rightfully it's like what are you being racist about this uh, if, if you're gonna blindfold me you need to blindfold the elf as well um and then legolas is like what you can't blindfold me this is you know these are my people aragorn has to step in and says okay okay everyone's gonna be blindfolded let's just Forget all of this nonsense, everyone will be blindfolded, and then we'll just get there. Um, the, the friendship between Legolas and Gimli seems to start when Gimli becomes this kind of um, champion, 
uh, Arthurian champion for uh, uh, Galadriel. Now, we often, with our kind of like modern day gaze, say, "Oh, so he just fancies Galadriel." He, that, that's not what it is. He, the, Tolkien, was a an Arthurian legend scholar, and he. Um, was very aware of this idea of the knight's champion for the noble lady and the way that the, this, this was a pure love for the noble lady that the knight would then charge around the land and uh, and, and talk about the, the greatness of and beauty of, of their noble lady. And this was what was going on with Gimli. And that seemed to change Legolas's mind. Gimli had seen the beauty of what elves could do and be and that seemed to trigger something within legolas where he could understand and he could say okay this this dwarf can actually be my friend and from that moment on they were pretty much inseparable they were together in one of the boats legolas was one of the few who actually knew how to use a boat so he uh he was paddling and uh, and gimli was in the same boat as him they get part way down the river and we get probably one of the greatest moments for legolas when he's sort of gazing up everyone can see there's something there's something up there i don't know quite what it is I, that doesn't make me feel good um legolas can see this is what we call a fell beast this is the first sighting of the black riders the nazgul on their new mounts, these kind of like flying wyvern kind of creatures. And Legolas gets out his bow and he shoots it down. Uh, most people can barely see it, but he shoots it down. Now, it's an oft overlooked incident and we should just probably take it as being an incident, a cool thing that Legolas did. But I think we should probably acknowledge the fact that if that Nazgul had seen them, had been able to come down low enough to actually see who was there, that would have been a huge problem. All of the orcs of the land would have descended on where they were. Legolas prevented that because, as I say, he's the person with the bow, he's the person with the ranged, ranged attack. So, um, after we get the breaking of the fellowship and we get Aragorn, Gimli and Legolas heading off, they, uh, they decide to go and find and save Merry and Pippin. They head off after the orcs. Um, we get the incident in Fangorn. When they're in Fangorn, Fangorn is a forest that Legolas... He was a bit nervous to go into, but also he was quite excited. He saw this was beauty. It was raw beauty. Um, and he, he looked around and he saw astonishing things there. Um, when they encounter Gandalf, Gandalf brings with him words from Galadriel for all of them. Because Gandalf, when he returned from the dead... He got picked up by uh, the eagle, taken to Galadriel to be healed, and then he came back to Fangorn Forest. So, and Galadriel left him with messages for the three of them. And Legolas got a message, I'll read it out a bit later because I've got a question on it, um, but basically the message is, um, when you hear a seagull, uh, that's it. From that moment on, you will feel the call of the sea. You will feel the call to head west. You will never again be as relaxed and happy and at home as you were um, in the forest. You will want to go over the sea and go to the Undying Lands. And that happened. That happened uh, a little while later. Um, from and, and Legolas almost bemoans it. It's, it's like it feels to him... I mean, this is a great and wonderful thing. He knows he's going to the Undying Lands. He loves this concept 
but everything he has known and loved before that is in Middle Earth, and that he now wishes to leave. So this is really kind of bittersweet for uh, for Legolas. Still, he uh, he follows uh, Aragorn. He carries on with with Gimli. They um, they are there for um, the uh, the Battle of the Hornburg, Helm's Deep, and. Um, Following on from that, they go through the paths of the dead. Uh, they find the, um, the army of the dead. They move on through, take a part in the Battle of the Palinor Fields. All of this, we don't get huge amounts about what Legolas's role is. He, um, he clearly is heroic in the defense of the Hornburg. He, 41... Uh, orcs he killed in that which is when you stop and think about it a ridiculous number at least 20 were um, before they even breached the walls with with, with his arrows he, he he shot them down now um he's there again when they go up to the uh, the battle of the moranon um and he's there when aragorn is made king afterwards which is the point where we kind of lose track on what happens with him in the story. So Legolas, after that, he um, he agreed to stay around for a little while, just to hang out in Minas Tirith for a while. But then he goes on this little road trip with Gimli. Gimli says, I want to show you what I saw behind the Hornburg. It's, it's not something they showed on the films, unfortunately, but um, in the books, uh, Gimli is there and he kind of makes an escape with several others out the back door of, of Helm's Deep. There's this cave system out the back that they managed to, they being Gimli and, and a few others and a huge amount of the women and children, they make their way out, way out through this cave system. And it is beautiful. In there, the glittering caves, it's called, because of all the uh, the gemstones there are in the walls. And Gimli is just like, wow! All of his dwarvish um, love of mining comes to the fore, and he says, "This, this is amazing." Sure enough, uh, cut forward a few years, Gimli brings a colony of dwarves there, becomes the lord of the glittering caves, turns it into an amazing place. But first. He wanted to show Legolas. After he's shown Legolas, then Legolas takes him to Fangorn and they have a proper look around the forest. So they've each, this is the depth of their fellowship, of their uh, friendship now, is they've each shown each other what they, from their culture, from who they are, from the depths of their soul, they love the caves, the glittering caves, the forest, the, the ancient forest. Then um, Legolas, after that, he heads back home. Then he comes with some elves and he sets up home in Ithilien, which is that bit, if you think of Gondor, when you get the uh, the river in Gondor, which goes through Osgiliath, and then you get the bit on the east of the, that river near Mordor. That's where he sets up home with these orcs, grows trees, sets up gardens, and this is a beautiful place. So basically, he turns into a gardener for, a, for quite a few years of the Fourth Age. And Faramir, incidentally, is the, the king there at the time, and they do, they, they, they get on well. Then Legolas, he's been fighting against this call to head west all of this time. Finally, he gives in. Gimli is an old man at this time, and Gimli is allowed to head west as well as the champion of Galadriel. And the last we see and hear uh, from Legolas is that the two of them in a boat head off west. And this is uh, astonishing. The, we, we read all the way through the Silmarillion into the Lord of the Rings, the histories dwarves and elves do not get on and yet the last thing we hear about the elf representative in the fellowship and the dwarf representative within the fellowship is that they were friends and together they sailed west and that is what Tolkien wants as our abiding memory 
of the two of them. They were different. They loved different things, and yet they cared for each other as friends. So Legolas is a fascinating character. He is the representative of elfdom through the Fellowship of the Ring, um, both sort of symbolically in, um, in being chosen to be a part of the Fellowship, but also in what he does. He is the kind of the, the elf in the scene. And if we want to know what an elf is like, we look at Legolas. And this is, as I think, a tribute to Legolas and to Tolkien more broadly. If we were to look at fantasy fiction across the piece since then, if you were to think of an elf, what is an elf like? Good with the bow, um, really kind of like uh, lithe and dexterous, um, eternal, um, beautiful. It's Legolas. Legolas was created by Tolkien to be the archetypal elf. And that's exactly what he has become. If you look at D&D, if you look at Warcraft, if you look at any one of a dozen or more major fantasy uh, uh, book series, that's what elves are. And more than the elves in the First Age, in the Silmarillion, and any of the elves that we might see in The Hobbit, the elf archetype is Legolas. Okay, so that's the sort of the uh, overview of uh, who Legolas is. Um, let's take a quick look at the chat. Um, got um, Mara Lee saying, just a show of love, appreciation, and support. Thank you so much for all the fabulous content, stories, and merch. Looking forward to getting my Blood Raven t-shirt in the mail. We'll wear it proudly. I'm, I'm really glad. Uh, the, yeah, the Blood Raven t-shirts, if you ordered a Blood Raven t-shirt, then they should be coming out to you very soon. They were, for those who uh, don't know what I'm talking about, the when in doubt, blame Blood Raven. This is a, uh, I know this is a Lord of the Rings um, stream, but uh, that's a very much an A Song of Ice and Fire t-shirt. Um, I, with wonderful artwork from San Rixian, um, the, that t-shirt I gave out free to anyone who was a $10 or more patron uh, of mine, anyone who signed up to be a $10 or more uh, patron. It is still available. You've missed, I'm afraid you've missed that deadline, uh, which was at the end of last month. But um, hopefully underneath this video, you will see a link to my shop. So if you would like that, or if you just want to see what it looks like, uh, have a click on that link. Um, Let's go to, uh, I think I have another question here from uh, Zach uh, Nado. I'm not sure if I can see a question. Um, uh, oh, just saying no question. Just want to say I got my Blood Raven t-shirt today. Excellent. Delighted to uh, hear that. Um, Caius Ballerina saying, um, how did you feel about his inclusion and the love triangle in the Hobbit movies. Um, right, yeah, so I had somebody else asking about the um, the Hobbit movies. So um, let's see if I can try and find that question. Um, uh, perhaps I can't, uh, but in terms of, uh, oh, Kelly Summers um, saying, oh no, it wasn't Kelly Summers. I, I apologize. Somebody asked about uh, the Hobbit movies. I will address this. Um, so Legolas was alive during the time of The Hobbit. Now, Peter Jackson in clearly included him in the Ho Hobbit trilogy of movies in quite a major role. He is never mentioned, just factually, he is never mentioned in uh, The Hobbit itself. He hadn't invented the character yet, but he was clearly there. So I from a purist perspective. I have no problem with Legolas being there. I have no problem with Legolas appearing in those movies. Um, I also, I mean, I have quite a 
a relaxed view of adaptations compared to some. Um, I've also got no problem with the fact that they um, increased his role a little bit. Uh, what I would say is that Peter Jackson clearly was a bit of an ALF fanboy, um, by which I mean that um, if you look at the Lord of the Rings films in particular, elves are all beautiful and ethereal and almost perfect and otherworldly, which doesn't really fit with the way that Tolkien describes elves. Elves are as fallible as humans, particularly if you read your way back to the Silmarillion. Um, but Peter Jackson wished to portray them pretty much universally as this kind of like higher being. When we get to uh, the the Hobbit, this means that Legolas, who performed some incredibly cool feats in the Lord of the Rings, he wanted him to be doing action shots and fantastic feats in the Hobbit. There were a couple that, for me, uh, defied gravity a little bit too much uh, to work. So, I, as a, as a general concept, I don't mind him being there. I actually didn't mind him too much playing a, an expanded role the the love triangle we had um which if you remember um was a sort of a dwarf elf elf love triangle was 100 made up for the movies personally i didn't like it that much um i, I mean th there are some who did i i don't uh, I find it hard to get too worked up and excited about it. It has to be said, it didn't work for me. For me, that was one of the things, well, one of quite a few things in the Hobbit movies that just fell a little bit flat for me. That doesn't mean that I didn't enjoy them. I did enjoy them, but it just it didn't quite work. It was trying to add in a thing that was not in the original story to sort of add an extra layer to it that I don't think it needed. Um, so, um, yeah, if if you liked it, fine. I have absolutely no problem with that. Personally, it didn't work that well for me. Um, let's have a flick through. I'm sure I had some more questions here somewhere. Oh, Clueless Fangle. Hi there. You're in the chat. Um, uh, and question from Callie Summer saying, hey Robert, no extra questions for now, just want to show my appreciation for your enthusiasm and great content. Uh, also, shout out to the mods. Yes, uh, never too early to give a shout out to the moderators. If you are watching this live, if you are um, in the chat, then the chat is such a wonderful and uplifting and uh, safe space for everyone because of the moderators. The moderators do an astonishing job. Uh, they are the true heroes of this channel. So, if you are watching live and if you uh, are in the chat, please just show a little bit of love for the moderators. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to a question from, from my patrons. So, uh, Jules Holman, how do you think film Legolas differs from the books? Uh, and what do you make of Orlando Bloom as Legolas? Uh, so uh, I thought Orlando Bloom did a great job. Personally, I think he was um, uh, exactly what they wanted and needed. I thought that he, there was no surprise to me that he was one of the breakout stars as a result of that film. Um, I thought him as Legolas, great. Um, in terms of the differences between book and film. Book Legolas was a lot more light-hearted. He's always, like, semi-joking. He is... He's still young-ish for an elf, as far as we can tell. But um, he's been alive for longer than all, all of them, apart from Gandalf. And... Um, as a result, he seems to take things slightly less seriously than the rest of them do, even the end of the world. So that's something which is slightly... They, they put a lot of the more humorous side over onto Gimli um, and allowed Legolas, therefore, to be more this kind of, like, um, 
cool character who who doesn't necessarily sort of engage in everything. Um, but yes, that means that you missed out. On, and the lightheartedness plays well, incidentally, all the way back into The Hobbit, because when you encounter the elves in The Hobbit, they're feasting, they're getting drunk, they're having fun, they're, they're enjoying life. That was what Legolas grew up with, and that was what he brought to the Fellowship. He was also... Um, uh, he, he was heroic, but the film definitely included more... Um, heroic moments, let's put it that way. So if you think every, almost every film within the Lord of the Rings trilogy and then to the, the Hobbit, there was a Legolas moment when he does something just awe-inspiringly brilliant, whether it's like um, surfing a shield down some s stairs and shooting at people, whether it's um, running up an Oliphant's um, trunk to shoot it and kill it, uh, whatever it is, he does an astonishing thing in every form. He doesn't do that in the books. He's actually quite low-key in his competence. He's undoubtedly competent, but he is he's less showy about it. Um, some of this is just obviously you want to make uh, your feature film look cool. So there's no problem. I, mean, I don't have a problem with it, but it is a difference nonetheless. Um, and the other thing, I think it's probably noticeable in the books that he's, um, he's the least independent of the um, fellowship, by which I mean... Uh, he will he will voice his opinion, but if the bosses say we're doing this, he'll just go along with it. That's not exactly what the rest of the fellowship are like. Boromir obviously just does his own thing. Um, Aragorn is a leader and will lead wherever he wants. Frodo decides, oh, I'll just head off with the ring over here. Sam, forget the rest of the fellowship. I'm following Frodo. Pippin is always let's just doing it. it. The person out of all of them, because they're, they're quite a, a headstrong and disparate group, the person out of all of them who is most likely to go, what, what does Gandalf or Aragorn think? Okay, I'll do that then, is Legolas, um, which... Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's just a noticeable thing uh, about him. Maybe it's coming from the fact that he had a, a father who was king, and so there was always somebody who would have ultimate authority there. It's not a hundred percent clear, but he definitely is the kind of elf to follow orders, as opposed to the rest of the fellowship, who don't say much. Um. Martin S. saying, did Legolas's father, Thranduil, witness the dwarves sacking Doriath? If so, do you think that contributed to his negative attitude to dwarves, particularly uh, Thorin and his company? Okay, so a um, little bit of dwarf elf history. So Doriath, I, I said at the beginning, this is where Orifer, um, Legolas's grandfather, um, came from. He was in Doriath. Um, Thranduil, we don't know exactly when he was born, but he probably was alive there as well. What happened in Doriath was tragedy on many levels. This is all to do with uh, one of the, the Silmarils. Um, the Thingol had some dwarves there who were obviously great smiths, said, hey, can you put this fabulous jewel onto this wonderful necklace? The necklace had originally been made by the dwarves. They do it. Then they say, now, actually, you know what? We kind of want this now because this was our necklace originally and we kind of like that jewel. And then Thingol says, no, that's mine. So they kill him um, and then run away. And then the elves go and attack the, the dwarves. And then the dwarves get a bit angry about this. Then they attack uh, Menegroth, Doriath, and it escalates into pretty much a full-scale war. Now, obviously, that would have a negative impact on the view of dwarves within any elves who 
were there. Um, if you're a fan of this channel, you'll probably know that I think there's more than one side to this story. I, th I think you have to accept the fact that the um, the elves basically undertook ethnic cleansing against the dwar dwarves before this, uh, so it's not just like the dwarves did bad things to the elves, full stop. There are two sides to this story. Anyway, on this, the dwarves were definitely in the wrong, and um, uh, probably Thranduil was there. If so, yes, that would explain his attitude towards the dwarves in The Hobbit. When looked at as objectively as we can, uh, the dwarves, yes, they stumble into Thranduil's land, but they're starving, they're lost. The very least that somebody could do in terms of hospitality is to feed them and point to the direction they want to go to get out of the forest, which is actually not that far away. Um, so, okay, here's a bit of bread, go that way. Uh, but they don't. Thranduil captures them, puts them into jail, and says, you're there forever now, um, unless you tell me all of your story about where you're going and what you're doing. Um, it's, it's a bit harsh. <laughs> it's... It's not hospitable, it's not good, it's not nice. Um, does that come from some kind of cultural memory of the dwarves? I think so. Uh, I, we don't know 100% that he was there. If he wasn't there, then this will have come down from his father. But yeah, there's definitely something against the dwarves going on there. Um Question from, again, from Martin S. Thank you, saying, Did Thranduil and Legolas know Círdan, shipmaker and holder of Narya, until uh, he decided it would alleviate Gandalf's burdens and make it a gift? So Círdan was... Um, uh, he's the guy, if you remember from the films, he's the guy who makes the boats, makes the ships uh, over on the coast that the elves get in to head over to um, the Undying Lands. Now, he basically is situated there all the way through the Second and Third Age. Um, he's part of the Faladrim, um, who loved the sea and the water. Um, did, uh, did Legolas know him? No, Legolas never met him. Uh, Legolas stayed in Mirkwood, as far as we can tell. He didn't even go to Lothlorien, which is not that far away. Uh, so Legolas uh, almost certainly did not know him. Um, uh, Thranduil, it's possible, um, but uh, my general feeling is that Thranduil, he was in Doriath, um, and then he headed east, and that's pretty much it. So I, I think the short answer is very probably no. Uh, Vilma Kanta saying, Hi, Robert. Thank you for all that you do. Are there any in-world reasons for our dates and calendar being, for our dates and calendar being used in Tolkien's works? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Um, uh, so, yeah, in in-world, then he does, he uses... Uh, January, February, March, etc. Um, is there a sort of an in-world reason? I, th I think the only one is that to Tolkien, Middle Earth um, and Ardamor generally, it's our world. It's our world in his way of saying it's our world, but in a, a different era of imagination. So he is kind of making the connection between our world and that world. Now, we could sort of go back and critique it and say, well, yes, but July comes from Julius Caesar, August from Augustus Caesar. Well, I don't, I, I don't think Tolkien went that deep um, on this. He, he went deep on a huge amount of things, but I suspect that in this, he just wanted us to understand it because this is our world. And so he could he could perhaps have gone back and said, oh, well, what, what sort of calendar 
was there in sort of northwest Europe way back in the mists of time. But that would just alienate us from it. So I think that what he just probably just did was go, well, I'll use the same kind of calendar um, and uh, that will allow us to see or, or more accurately to feel that we're in 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 some kind of simpatico there. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether that really answers your question, but that's that's really where we're at. Um, Mark Sheese is saying, if Legolas never knew Kirdan, um, how did he make a boat that was able to reach the Undying Lands? Um, we're not told. Is the short answer that so? Um, Kirdan waited until the last before going. Um, so uh, if Legolas did make his own boat, which I don't think is 100% confirmed, but if he did, then it's, well, it's possible there were boats left behind. It's possible that there were um, instructions left behind. Kirdan... Uh, I don't know whether you saw my video on him. I did. I mean, it was probably a couple of years ago now. He, he's a great character because he's incredibly... Um, he, it's tragic that he wanted to go to the Undying Lands, um, but then he hung back, hung back, and he built boats for other people again and again and again to go to the Undying Lands, but he knew that his role was to stay behind his role was to make sure that everybody else could get there until finally he could it's millennia of him longing to go to the undying lands himself but not doing it because he knew he had a, a job to do a role to play so um if he for one second thought that there might be an elf who wanted to go to the undying lands that might not have a boat he would have done something about it he would have left a boat he would have left instructions about how to build a boat he would have done something so i don't personally find this a huge surprise that there's also boat i mean humans had boat technology it's not just the elves and and it's not the boat that was magical and special. It was the route that you took that was magical and special. Um, Martin S., how would you rank these fellows in swordsmanship uh, and swordsmanship only? Okay, interesting. Um, Aragorn, Elrond, Glorfindel, and Thranduil. Okay, well, chat, this is a good one for you to... Um, uh, uh to do your own choices on um we don't we don't get huge amounts of um comparators here which makes it quite hard we we don't see much of thranduil in battle um we don't see frankly huge amounts of elrond in battle aragorn is clearly a very competent fighter glorfindel uh, killed a balrog so I think we should probably put Glorfindel up top. Um, uh, Aragorn probably second. Um, and then Elrond and Thranduil, we don't frankly have enough evidence one way or the other to, uh, to say where they might rank. Um, uh, Vilma Kantar just picking up on the dates thing, saying I like the idea of it being a... a, a Translation, translational thing between languages. Thank you for your answers, Robert and Chat. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the things I love is the fact that the chat. I don't have all the answers. I, I've never pretended to have all the answers. Um, I mean, I, I read and obsess over these these books, uh, but um, there's always experts uh, in the chat. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm delighted if people in the chat have uh, good or better answers than me. Um, uh, just people just trying to pick up on them. Kelly Summers saying Glorfindel, Aragorn, Elrond, Thranduil. Uh, Homebody saying we don't see Legolas sword fighting. Um, 
Mark is saying, didn't Glorfindel just make the Balrog fall off a cliff? Uh, well, he did, but he did it by fighting him. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this incidentally, <laughs> long, long time followers of this channel. Yes, Balrog fell off and didn't use his non-existent wings. Uh, so um, that's the thing about Balrogs. If they do have wings, they always forget to use them. Um, and Barbara Hello saying, what is a scene from the books that included Legolas that you would have wished to see on screen but wasn't, or differently or differently than was? Uh, love the lives. Well, I'm glad you're appreciating it. That's a, that's a really, um, it's a good question. What would I have loved to see Legolas do that was in the books? Um, I mean, I can't. I can't remember him shooting down the fell beast in the films. Now, this is the point at which somebody will be able to, in the chat, say uh, that, yes, he definitely did. But um, uh, I can't remember in the films that he had that moment when he looked up and nobody else could really see it. Um, and he shot it down because at that moment in the films, they were very much focused. No, I understand it. The, the film and books, they're different art forms, so they need to follow slightly different pace. And if you remember when they're paddling down there and doing, the the tension that they're building up is the fact that we've got Saruman has just sent out this force of Uruk High hunting for them. And so it kind of like cuts between the two. Uh, here's the fellowship paddling down the river. Here we get the Uruk High. Um, that was what they did. So I think I think that they cut that from uh, the films. But I'm happily happy to be um, uh, disabused of that motion. Um, Homebody saying Glorfindel, Aragorn, Gandalf, Elrond, Legolas, Thranduil. Yeah, adding a few extra uh, people in there. Um, uh, Cole Carstock saying Robert Loki trolling the elf. And winged Balrog apologists in the chat. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, Tkeldal Amroth saying penguins have wings. Penguins do have wings. Balrogs, yeah, not so much. Um, uh, so, um, and this always gets sent off uh, into uh, Balrogs and wings territory. Octane saying Balrogs seem to be very clumsy. I now know of two Balrogs. And both fell off cliffs and met their end. Yeah, Belrogs are clumsy. Always forget to use their wings. Um, Exthelion, Mark, she's saying Exthelion was a better fighter than Glorfindel. Perhaps. Uh, Connor Palachek saying hello from the US. Hi there. Um, love the channel and new to the live chats. Well, welcome. Um, more of a fun question. If you were to have a drink with Legolas, what would you chat about? Cheers to the mods and all fellow geeks. I mean, I think I would just ask him to talk about the good old days um, and uh, in um, uh, in Merkwood. I would just love to learn more about that world. Um, uh, okay. Uh, oh, Jules Hellman's also pointing out, yeah, this is a really good point, actually, that um, when you were, you asked, actually, the question, didn't you? Um, how does the film Legolas differ from the books? You say he sings a lot in the books. It's a shame he didn't in the films. Yeah, there, there are a lot more in the books. This is one of the things that I always uh, find when people read the books for the first time. There's a lot more singing. There's a lot more poetry than most people are expecting. And Legolas does sing a lot. He sings when they go into Lothlorien. He sings a lament to Gandalf. He sings for, for Boromir. He, he's always singing songs. And sometimes these are sad laments. Sometimes they're actually quite cheery songs. So, yeah, him singing is uh, definitely one of the, the key things that's going on there. Um, Alison saying, hello, Robert. Hi there. Um, it seems to me that one of the main purposes of Legolas from a literary standpoint is to represent the race of elves. How well does Legolas do that? Um, in what ways is he a classic Tolkien elf and in what ways is he unique among elves? Um, well, I mean, this is quite hard to say because I mean, I think that the, the big point is that he has been taken 
as the archetypal elf going forward for every other fantasy world that you could possibly imagine. If you think, what is an elf like? It is like Legolas. The, the important point looking backwards is that whereas if you go to almost any adaptations, I'm not just picking on one, but almost any adaptation of Tolkien's works, elves are treated as pretty much the same across the piece. There might be a few nods to you're an old or elf, you're a, an elf of Merc, whatever. But broadly speaking, elves are elves are elves. That's not how Tolkien saw it. Elves are very different. The, they were, and they were very clear on their lineage. And some elves are not good, and some elves are, are genuinely amazing people. And some elves, like Galadriel, go on huge character arcs. So this when we get Legolas, we're almost getting like a snapshot in time of an elf. Um, but elves as a whole are incredibly heterogeneous or heterogeneous. That, that they're, they are as different to each other as humans are. Um, it's probably also worth saying, though, at a slightly more meta level, that... Tolkien's elves, I say they're all very different, but they start off overview of history of the elves. I did a video about this a couple of weeks ago, which um, it starts getting very complicated very quickly when you try to describe all the different ways or explain all the different names and titles and types of elves that we have. They start off as one people, the Quendi, but very quickly we see they break down into three types of people. Um, and uh, then they get the call to go to Valinor, and then some of them head off west, and some of them stay behind, and so you have another break between the two of those who follow the call, those who do not, and then those who follow the call, some of them kind of get lost along the way, and some of them don't, um, and then uh, some of them decide to turn back and then some of the original ones who said no then come up and join the first it gets very complicated very quickly with the elves and all the different types of elves however when you get to the end of the third age towards the end of the time of the elves actually there's not many elf homelands left when you're thinking about the first age or the second age elves were everywhere they're all over the continent when you get to the end of the uh, the third age we don't really think about this because we focus mostly on the third age because of the lord of the rings and the hobbit but they're just down to their last few small enclaves we get rivendell we get mirkwood we get lothlorien we get a few over at the grey havens i mean they, that's it that we really read about as groups of elves and each of those groups of elves are not um just one type the the elves we have in mirkwood for example they um the leadership of them this is where Thranduil and Orifer came from. Uh, they came across, as I say, from uh, from Doriath, and they um, uh, they were grey elves, basically. Um, they headed across, but they then joined these wood elves. So they were Sindar, uh, the name, and then they they started ruling over the Sylvan elves. However, the Sylvan elves, the wood elves. There were also some of some of those were people who had come all the way from the east of ones who years and years and years ago had just not followed the call of the Valar and come in and they'd stopped there. So what we have in Mirkwood is an incredibly mixed picture to the extent that Legolas, when he's kind of introduces himself, at one point he says that he's a Sindar elf, and another point he says he's a Sylvan elf, because he's a bit of both, and it actually no longer really matters. So um, 
Um, how does Legolas encapsulate all of of them? Well, actually, quite well at that point, in that he doesn't really know which type of elf he he is an elf in a way that hadn't been possible to say ever since the very beginning. Um, and the other thing, thing to say is that he's young. For an elf, he's young. Um, and uh, in human standards, obviously, he's very, very old. But the way that he approaches his, approaches life, this kind of slightly light-hearted uh, way, is not the same for all elves. So does he represent them thematically? Yes, he does represent them. Looking forward what we think of an elf is him. So yes, he does represent them. But does he represent every elf ever? No. Um, question from uh, Martin S. saying, if Fingolfin fought in the Battle of the Hornburg, what would be his kill count? Um, leaving out uh, Eonwe, Arome, and Tolkas, because they would be insane. So Fingolfin was a uh, first age legendary elf. Uh, legendary to the point at which he took on Morgoth, the big, big baddie um, of the first age, and held his own and injured him and did quite well. And he he was pretty astonishing, Fingolfin. If you had to rank who were the greatest fighters, um, elf fighters ever, you'd probably put him top. Um, so what would his kill count be? Massive. Absolutely ridiculous. So, um, yeah. Uh, the... <coughs> Pardon me, sorry. Enwe, Rome, Tolkas, yeah, definitely. They would, uh, uh, they would be OP there. Uh, uh, Barbara Hero saying, picking up a question from Octane. Thank you. I love it when people do this, picking up questions for other people. How would the ring tempt Legolas? Um, yeah, I think I had a, one of my patrons ask that one as well, but I'll happily pick this one up here. So, um, it's hard to say is the answer because we're never really seen, we, we never really see the the heart of Legolas. What probably until that point where he starts to get the sea longing, he he probably given his love of uh, the forests, given his uh, his enjoyment of um, comes from Mirkwood, uh, wine and feasts and good things, probably it would be to be ruling wisely over a great kingdom of abundance um, where everybody could be enjoying uh, the, uh, the forests. That is how the ring worked. Sam, remember Sam Gamgee, got tempted as being the world's greatest gardener, basically. So it just goes to what is what's in your heart? What is it that you want the most? Um, we never really asked this about Gollum, but the clear implication is that Gollum, his ambitions were also quite small because he had for 500 years, half a millennium, he had the one ring. And what did he do? He had like a small part of the world underneath the misty mountains where he could every now and then kill an orc and catch some fish and things like that. That was clearly what he was tempted to do. So for Legolas, yeah, I think he would have just been tempted with the, the easy life and ruling. Um, question from Martin S saying, some elves are nasty, but I don't think any of them... Uh, um, any ever are what I call shadow aligned, which is basically willingly serving the main evil in the franchise, in Tolkien's case, Morgoth or Sauron. Well, yeah, we have a number of um, um, dark elves. Now, again, this is something that the fantasy world has sort of taken and run with. Um, the, the, the key difference between light elves and dark elves for Tolkien was whether or not they had seen the light of the two trees. 
uh, whether they had followed the call of the Velar to go over to the Undying Lands. And the light of the two trees was not just light, this was pure and holy light. Um, so if you had seen it, then you were pure and holy in some way. If you had not, then you were dark. And we're told that uh, these histories are all written from the perspective, of course, of these um, Calaquindi, the, the light elves. Um, so bear that in mind. But we're told that the dark elves were so-called not just because they wanted to live in darkness, but because they were okay with Morgoth's darkness. They were okay with um, uh, the fact that with Morgoth then the sun, you, know, you would not see the sun, you would not see the stars, there, there would be perpetual gloom, um, and this was a really bad thing for those elves. And that took with it, therefore, a kind of a, a moral judgment that you're okay with Morgoth then. So the Light Elves, the Elves of the West, the Elves who'd gone to Valinor, would definitely see the Dark Elves in that light. Um, I think it, Tolkien leaves it open for us to decide whether that's really the case. Uh, Vilma Kanta saying Gimli struggles with his relationship with Legolas. Does Legolas have the same doubts and suspicions about Gimli? Um, I find Gimli a lot more emotionally honest, I have to say, as a character than almost any of the other members of the Fellowship. Um, he he f faces more um, issues, things being thrown at him, emotional uh, problems than anyone else. He, uh, the, he sees the death of his relatives in, in Moria, uh, or their tombs. Um, he is the victim of racism in Lothlorien. Uh, he has to go to places like Fangorn that he's only heard terrible, evil things about. He he sucks it all up. He sees Galadriel, who he's only ever heard terrible things about, and he readjusts his worldview. I think that he... I've got a huge amount of time for Gimli as a, a character going on a character journey. Legolas a lot more... Um, uh, just straight down the line <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, his relationship with Gimli, he seems to start to like Gimli at the point at which Gimli clearly starts to like elves. So it feels as if the first push on this is with Gimli. And Gimli is, he's the one who's kind of, if, if you're looking for the the cues of who's who's trying to be a friend. Gimli's the one who seems to be pushing it a little bit more. Uh, he starts the lighthearted joshing about how many have you killed? Oh, I'll, I'll only count that as 20. I'll carry on. I'll, I'll kill more than you. Kind of. He starts these little bits of competition. He's the one who sort of says, oh, you would love to see this. Um, uh, so I, I think Gimli puts more into it and is more open Legolas perhaps um, uh, slightly less. And I, the fact that he is very old almost certainly plays into this because elf friendships develop over decades, centuries. Dwarf friendships take a lot less time. Um, that boy Q saying, first time watching you live after nearly a year. Well, hi, welcome. Great to see you. My question is, does Legacy have any legendary ancestors? Oh, I assume that means Legolas. I think, I think that's probably a typo um, or an autocorrect, probably. Have any legendary ancestors? Thanks for the hours of work and content. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, we know him back to Orifer, uh and Thranduil. Now, um, where do you count them as legendary? Um, I don't know, but they certainly played their role. Uh, I don't know whether you're here slightly earlier in the live stream. I was talking about Orifer in the last Alliance of Elves and Men. He brought the, the elves out from Greenwood the Great, his forest, 
and took them down to, for the siege of Mordor um, and basically decided he didn't need to follow orders and led to a massive battle that they didn't do very well in. Why is this legendary? Because of that misadventure, because of that charge and attack without being told that he should do so, then that happened and the battle that followed happened in some marshland. If you remember the Lord of the Rings, the dead marshes just outside Mordor, you see faces of elves looking up with candles. Those are Orifer's people. Those are the people who died because he would not wait for the, the order to attack. He was arrogant enough to go out and, and attack the, the forces of evil himself. And that is uh, um, the result of it. And Thranduil, Orifer's son, Legolas's father, Thranduil um, survived that and carried that memory with him, carried the horror of that moment with him. And Thranduil is the person who we see in The Hobbit as uh, the Elven King. Um, I think that's me caught up um, in the chat. Let's go to a question from... Um, oh, it's slightly slightly broader than uh, Legolas, this one, but Martin Siostrand saying, the question is about Uru Iluvatar, who is the, the big one god of Tolkien's world. Uh, perhaps this is a theological question, and perhaps me wondering if it is due to me not having a particularly religious mindset. Anyway, I have seen comments stating that Uru is infinitely more powerful than any, any other or created being, including Melkor Morgoth. Um, here is the thing. I believe vastly but finitely more powerful than Melkor should suffice. If Aru were not infinite, but only something like a Google Times Melkor with similarly vast ability to wield the flame perishable, that would hardly be a meaningful limitation. Um, so, uh, in short, how can it be known that a creator god like Aru is infinite when incomprehensibly big? but finite should be enough to explain what they have done. Uh, so uh, I, this is really interesting. Yes, I think you're right. This is a theological question. And we have to remember that Tolkien was a very strong Christian, a very strong Catholic. Um, and he created his world as, in his conceptualization, a sub-creation. So he saw, um, he saw what he did not as just here I am as a rando human being I'm just going to create a nice pretty world he thought that what he he had within him was some spark from his own the god that he worshipped a spark of creativity was within him that allowed him to then go on and create this other thing so that is what we've got going on with him this is a theological issue this is not a mathematical issue or logical issue um, so when you're talking about would this be enough to explain the role of Iluvatar Ar just to say that he is he's just incredibly powerful not that he's infinitely powerful he's incredibly powerful yes it would be enough yes yeah, of course if you if all you wish to do was explain that you've got an incredibly powerful creator being you could say that but um for literary purposes or, or sub-creational purposes i should probably say Aru Aluvatar is not just another random thing or being he is god he is outside of space and time he is the person who creates everything he can create things from nothing in a way that nobody else can um so it's not an issue of is it enough is it enough literarily that you have a creator god who is more powerful than nothing else yeah perhaps but in terms of the universe that he was creating which was uh, an echo of the universe that his belief and experience um saw in his own world then he needed 
that uh, created God to be bigger than that, to be infinite in a way. Um, the other thing I think to just to add on to that is to say that the way Tolkien wrote it, and again, we're going a bit meta here, so uh, apologies, we'll get back on to just randomly talking about uh, Legolas in just a moment, but um, uh, in in terms of the way that Tolkien wrote and his writing conceit was that he, Tolkien, wasn't just a person writing a story. He was within this world that he had created, and he was within this world as being uh, some sort of um, literary uh, investigator, professor, who had stumbled across these ancient writings and was translating them for a modern audience. And as a result, it's not that Tolkien, in his writing conceit, Tolkien himself did not write these stories of creation, these stories of Uru Libertar. That was not him who did it. It was the elves. We have, I mean, again, I did a video quite recently about this, who wrote Tolkien's work in World. Um, the first bits of the Silmarillion were written by the elves themselves. So... Um, this is not, although we often, and I mean, I, I sometimes kind of stumble into this myself, but we often talk about things within Tolkien's legendarium as being um, kind of objective. This is definitely the case. This this is not a matter of something being objectively true. This is somebody in world has written, and that is what they believe. So... Eru Aluvatar is described and explained not because that is what they are, but that is what the elves who wrote about him believe that he is. As I say, it's a little bit meta. We'll get back to uh, we'll get back to uh, Legolas now. So um, the short version is. Yes, if you just wanted to write a story where you had a, a, a god who was powerful, you could just say, well, this is his finite amount of power. But that's not what Tolkien was uh, wanting to write about. Um, okay, uh, let's go to King of Imps saying, hey, Robert, hey, uh, saying Tolkien's original thoughts on the Fellowship were that Glorfindel was meant to represent elves, but felt that he was too powerful a character and introduced Legolas to fill that role instead. How would the story have changed if Glorfindel had indeed been one of the Nine Walkers instead of Legolas? Um, well, this is this is fascinating. Glorfindel is a great character. We, we won't go into detail here, but he was around back in the First Age. He killed a Balrog, um, died in the process. Uh, but was so valorous and wonderful and amazing that he kind of got fast-tracked back into Middle-earth. Uh, he went to the halls of Mandos. They said, yeah, you don't really have to stay here very long. You can go back to Valinor. When he was in Valinor, they said, well, do you mind going back to Middle-earth and just helping out for a bit? So he just kind of got circulated back, arrives back in the Second Age. And, um, pardon me, it's... When he's there, he is incredibly powerful. Um, to the extent that it's a sort of an overlooked detail, but when when we have uh, that bit in the Fellowship of the Ring, while they're trying to get the ring, well, Frodo and the Hobbits are with Aragorn, and they're sort of somewhere west of Rivendell, and they're trying to get across to Rivendell. Uh, Elrond knows roughly what's going on and doesn't know exactly where it is and he sends out some of his people to go looking for whoever it is who's bringing the ring to him he sends out Glorfindel Glorfindel uh, rides out and he um, he does eventually find uh, Frodo and the Hobbits and Aragorn but before that he goes out and uh, he comes to a river not the river that we saw just outside uh, Rivendell, but another one. And on his horse, he stands there on his horse and he just kind of guards the crossing over the river. 
And the Black Riders, including the Witch King, they see him guarding this river. And they go, ah, oh, nope, we're not going to try and take him out. And then they go, it's, this is in the Lord of the Rings. And then they go, okay, we'll we'll just do a bit of a detour. We need to cro uh, cross this river, but we'll we'll ride like a day south and then cross the river further south and then come back on the other side. We're not facing Glorfindel. That's how impressive and powerful he is. And um, when he does meet um, Frodo, he you will remember i'm sure in the films we get arwen who comes and found uh, finds uh, aragon what's this a ranger caught off his guard um that moment that's actually gorfindel in the books um gorfindel finds them and uh, frodo we see it for just a moment from frodo's uh, pov and he just sees this bright shiny figure um and then when he wakes up in Rivendell, he, he, and Gandalf is there, and Gandalf explaining everything, he he sort of says, you know, what what was that? What was what was going on there? Um, and this is this is the exchange, which I think is great. It says here, this is Gandalf speaking. Here in Rivendell, there there live still some of Sauron's chief foes, the Elven Wise, lords of the Eldar from beyond the furthest seas. They do not fear the ring rates. For those who have dwelt in the blessed realm live at once in both worlds, and against both the seen and the unseen, they have great power. And Frodo says, I thought that I saw a white figure that shone and did not grow dim like the others. Was that Glorfindel then? Yes. You saw him for a moment as he is upon the other side, one of the mighty of the firstborn. He is an elf lord of a house of princes. So Frodo sees Glorfindel sort of in the spiritual realm, bright and shining and just like incredibly beautiful. And that's what Glorfindel looks like to those who are in the spiritual realm. Those who are not just see a, uh, an elf. Um, and if you just imagine for one moment, what would have happened if Glorfindel had gone with the party? They do, they do briefly discuss this, actually, in the Council of Elrond, and they kind of go, yeah, but we're really after secrecy we're after tact we're after trying to catch the enemy unawares um they don't say it but if he'd gone out there with them for anyone who was in the kind of spiritual realm he's so otherworldly so holy he's kind of emanating off this white light and if he would just started walking towards mordor then Sauron, the ring race, they would have seen him from a mile off. So what would have happened? Any element of stealth would have been gone. The ring race would have honed in straight away. It was the sensible and wise decision not to take Glorfindel with them. Um, let's go to question from... Uh, Nate Davis saying, what's good, Robert? Hey, um, I have a couple of questions for you. Could you explain when or why uh, Legolas's people broke off from the other elves? Will we see one of his ancestors in the Rings of Power? Well, uh, so the Rings of Power is set in the Second Age of Middle-earth. They have squashed the timeline there, it has to be said. So in very broad terms, we'll come back to what this means in terms of Legolas' uh, ancestors in just one moment, but in very broad terms, what they seem to have done with the Rings of Power is said the first thousand years of the First Age happened. After that, it's just concertinaed in. We're just squashing it all in to a few years. Um, so that's what we've got. And then we, then we have to try and apply what does that mean to characters that we may or may not know. It means that very probably, or almost certainly, Orifer 
this is Legolas's grandfather was alive and probably he is there being the Lord of Mirkwood at the time oh it wasn't called Mirkwood it was called Greenwood the Great at the time um, we have seen Greenwood the Great it has to be said um, in Rings of Power uh, it gets a mention right at the very end when you get um, the Harfoots and uh, the Stranger and they're there looking at a forest and saying okay well there's Greenwood and all the other side of that is Anduin that last episode stuff that was Greenwood the Great the Lord of Greenwood the Great at the time was Olifer. We should see him in the last season as part of this last alliance of elves and men. We should also see Thranduil, who was a part of that army. Probably not Legolas. Um, as I say, we don't have a birth date for Legolas, but the working assumption is at some point in the Third Age. Um, so yeah, Orifer and uh, Thranduil we will probably see. Um, Travis, a question saying, hello, Robert, greetings from Ottawa today. Hi there, or bonjour, perhaps. I'm never 100% sure on how quebec -y Ottawa is. But um, anyway, my question is about the humorous banter between Gimli and Legolas during the Battle of Helm's Deep, where they're competing with each other over their body counts. I've always found this exchange very funny, but the more I learn about Tolkien's life, and specifically his experience with the war, this exchange feels almost callous. It also sticks out in my mind as really the only time in the book that I can recall where war and battle and death are treated in this lighthearted way. I guess I don't really have a question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, this is, I will say, um, this is a thing I've always found quite jarring as well. For those who do not know Tolkien, the person's history, Tolkien went to war when he was a young man he went to war in the first world war um and he experienced what was possibly the worst battle in that war the battle of the somme and uh if you ever read up about that battle and the war in general it just makes you cry for what one human can do to another um and it left tolkien himself quite understandably traumatized about everything that he'd seen and he he doesn't talk about it much he doesn't write about it much but when he does it's in quite this matter of fact way with this deep sadness to it he, he writes things like i uh, when i went to uh, the fields of belgium i had a dozen or more good friends when i returned i had two and it's like so the rest of them died and, and that's it that's all he says this hugely impacted on him and that does show through uh, undoubtedly into his writings we we talked about the, uh, the the dead marshes that is he admits one of the few times that his own personal experience leaked into his storytelling he, he saw quite gruesome but he saw dead bodies in puddles just staring up at him when he was at the Somme and that was reflected in what he wrote there about the dead marshes that's that's the feel that he was writing exorcising perhaps for himself um and as a result I th of this then he's not anti-war he he sees war as sometimes necessary but never he never glorifies war and he always when you read through um the lord of the rings or the hobbit wars battles they're rarely the center of they're, they're rarely given huge amounts of detail um to the extent that when you you look at the hobbit films almost an entire film almost the entire last film the battle of the five armies that entire battle was five pages in the hobbit um he describes it concisely clearly but without huge amounts of detail so it's a bit jarring when somebody with that history and the way that that plays out in the way that he writes that 
we get um, at the Battle of the it's called Battle of the Hornburg in the books, Battle of Helm's Deep. Um, Gimli and Aragorn play this sort of game with each other. How many of you killed? 41, 42. Um, is that not just a bit lighthearted for Tolkien? I mean, yes, is the answer. But I, I can only assume this is something from his own experience of how people cope, is that they almost disassociate. Um, they they have to turn things into games. They have to turn things into um, friendship. And it's, this is a friendship kind of joshing each other kind of thing. Leg, you know, Gimli says, you know, how, how many do you think you've killed? This is before the orcs have reached them. Gimli says, how many do you think you've killed? And Legolas goes, oh, at least 20. And Gimli says, I'll, I'll take that as 20. I'll, I'll get more than that. And and you can almost feel this kind of like male bonding, joshing kind of thing going on. Oh, I can do more than that. I don't think you can. Um, and then how many did you get? Oh, I got 41. I got 42. And that he's focusing not so much on actually the battle. He's focusing on the friendship. And this is how I've come around to interpret it, is that this isn't... Yes, this is kind of light-hearted banter about battle, but it's his way or one of his ways of twisting the narrative of the the death and destruction of a horrific battle where many, many people died to actually be about a burgeoning relationship, friendship between two people. So that's my take, is that, yes, it can sometimes feel a little bit jarring, but I think... I think it still works with my understanding of how how he coped. Uh, okay, let's go. Um, agree, we would saying gallows humor. Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. I think that's probably right. Uh, Carl Karsnock saying um, Tolkien was in charge of taking care of the horses which was still in wide use, especially early in the war. Lots of horse characters, names, places, etc. in the books, uh, of course. Yes, very much so. Um, um, uh, but Hello but saying, does In Deep Geek have a video about Galadriel already? Um, I feel sure I've got at least one video about Galadriel. Um, uh, do go and check back on it. Let's go uh, to a question from Johnny Sariani saying, Greetings, Robert. Greetings to you too, sir. The Hobbit movies get a lot of criticism for adding unnecessary things that were not in the text, one of them being Legolas in a role that is a glorified cameo. I disagree with this, since it was his kingdom and his father who were directly involved in the plot. Why wouldn't they want to show a familiar face? Obviously, many of his actions, especially in the third movie, largely deviate from the book. But whenever I reread The Hobbit now, I like to think of Legolas working in the background. Bilbo, of course, would not know who he is, um, but he could still be there. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I sort of touched on this a little bit before, but I can round it out a little bit more. I have absolutely no problem with, with Legolas being there and, and in the films. And I've got absolutely no problem with him having a, a role within them. The, the Hobbit itself is... It's a lot less serious film than um, uh, or book than uh, the Lord of the Rings, and so I think we should probably treat the films in a lot less serious way. Um, so, yeah, they inject a little bit of extra stuff in there with Legolas. I've got no particular problem with it. Um, I, I think the only issues I really had were, as I say, there, there was one moment when he was. Uh, jumping from one falling rock to another falling rock in a way that gravity just does not allow. Um, that I didn't particularly like. Um, the the bits when it was slightly him um, taking away from the story of what was going on with the dwarves also didn't particularly like because this is a, it's the story of the dwarves and the Hobbit. Um, but yeah, him being there, him being around, him being in the Battle of the Five Armies, no problem with him being there either. He probably was there. Um, 
Hi, Robert. Sorry, I didn't check who this who said this was one of my patrons saying looking forward to the stream loved the build a pony video um yeah that was a, a one of my most recent upbreak um uploads again probably the most fun video i've done for a while build a pony if you've never thought about build a pony if you imagine the the kind of the famous silhouette of the um the fellowship uh, all single file uh, marching along um there's a horse in there it's Bill the Pony, because Bill was really, he was the 10th member of the Fellowship. He, um, Tolkien loved, as Carl Karpsnark was saying, actually, in the, in the chat, he, he he really did major in on horses and horses' personalities. And Bill has a character arc. Bill the Pony has a very, very clear character arc that, to, that um, Tolkien gives him that takes him through the story. Uh, to the extent that, although we don't often think about it, we think he's mostly just there at the beginning and then maybe they pick him up at the end. He's he's there at the very end. The final scene of The Lord of the Rings has Bill in it. Um, when Sam heads off with Frodo, Merry and Pippin over to... Um, the Grey Havens, Frodo heads off, sails off west, and then they head back. And it all ends with Sam arriving home. Well, he said, I'm back. That journey was taken on Bill. So Bill the Pony was there right up until the very last moment. And, and that's where his forever home was with Sam. Um, and when you think of where he started and where he ended and he does start getting a character as he go through it was uh, it was a really fun video to just sort of pick that out but anyway um what do we know about legolas and aragorn's work together prior to the fellowship not a lot um legolas appears to uh not a lot because they don't appear to have had much by way of interactions legolas appears to have largely stayed in mirkwood through his life Aragorn spent most of his life uh, up um, in and around uh, Rivendell and then the area around sort of the, the Shire, what, what used to be the King of Arnor. Um, he does go off on his little epic road trip just to explore a little bit more of uh, his future kingdom. Um, he goes to Rohan for a bit, ends up in Gondor, goes to Minas Tirith, then he goes off and um, does some during do deeds around sort of the fringes of Mordor and then heads back. Um, he hunts for Gollum with Gandalf for a very long time, actually. It's like 16 years or something. He, he hunts for Gollum. Um, he captures him, takes him back to Mirkwood. There will have been some interaction, surely, between Aragorn and um, uh, Legolas in Mirkwood when Aragorn drops him off. Um, but that's it. So um, we don't know much because there wasn't much, basically. Uh, the two of them were aware of each other, but it's not as if they were close friends. Martin S. Uh, saying, thank you for asking my patron question about Uru Ulubatar. Um, it was as I suspected for theological reasons. Um, I think Gilgalad must have been a Fairly incredible elven warrior, especially with Igloss. Yes, so um, Gilgalad was, he was, he was, I mean, I can't remember the word Tolkien used, but ba basically he was pretty legendary. With it. So this is his spear, uh, Igloss. So he, um, it's mentioned in the same kind of breath as uh, Elendil with Narsil. And the two of them next to each other, they, they were really a, a force to behold. Um, so when Gilgalad is killed, that is, whoa, what's going on here? So, yes, he was pretty um, uh, pretty amazing uh, as a fighter. Not that we see him huge amounts fighting. It has to be said, even uh, in the, the pages of the Silmarillion, a lot of the time he delegated things to others, um, particularly to Elrond um, when first Sauron heads uh, across this we'll probably see a little bit of that actually in season two of the rings of power Elrond sort of uh sorry Sauron heads across uh the land um it is Elrond who is sent out to confront him rather than Gilgalad doing it personally 
Um, Kelly Summers saying, if Glorfindel would attract Sauron's attention, wouldn't Gandalf, the ring, and Aragorn be seen? Aragorn thought the plan uh, was for all to go to Mordor. So th this is different. So th the Glorfindel existed on two planes at once. He existed on the plane, uh, the our plane, and also in the spiritual plane. So he was there um, as well. So he would he would be seen. Gandalf um, did not really. He had sort of forsaken that part in in taking on the the appearance uh, of being an old man. Aragorn was a human. Yes, he's a human with an amazing uh, heritage, but he was a human. The One Ring is um, is a strange one. It, it does appear that if you put on the ring, then yes, people can see you. Um, but this is why Gandalf was always saying to Frodo, don't put on the ring. Um, if you put on the ring, they can see you. And when he's in Mordor, he does not put on the ring. So that's that's it. The ring in and of itself, yes, Sauron can sort of sense it because he has poured himself into the ring, but clearly not enough to be able to pinpoint where it is. He could never exactly say where it is. He could just kind of like be constantly calling it to himself. Um, let's go to a question from Mara Lee saying, when Legolas and his companions were finally reunited with Gandalf, um, Gandalf passed up to Legolas a message from Galadriel. What was it? And why did Legolas take it to mean that his time on Middle-earth was almost at an end? So yeah, th this, they definitely didn't have this in the films, but, um, Gandalf goes first to or he's carried. When he comes back, he gets carried over to Galadriel. Galadriel heals him for a while. Then he goes over to Fangorn, um, and he carries with him messages from Galadriel for the three of them. And what he says, uh, what the message is for Legolas is, Legolas Greenleaf, long under tree, enjoy thou hast lived, beware of the sea. If thou hearest the cry of the gull on the shore, Thy heart shall then rest in the forest no more. Now, it's it's fair to say that Legolas, I mean, he doesn't immediately respond to this, but um, the message is quite clear. All of the elves know about the the call from the sea, the the the, the sea longing, they call it. Um, the elves get this this sudden feel they have to they have to head west they have to go to the sea and legolas had not had that legolas had spent his life in mirkwood he'd enjoyed the trees he'd enjoyed the forest he'd enjoyed life in middle earth and so the message to him in that light is quite simple um you've been long under the tree uh, enjoy thou hast lived but beware of the sea. If you hear the cry of the gull on the shore, then your heart shall rest in the forest no more. It's actually a, a quite a straightforward. I mean, this isn't uh, much of a riddle. It's that if you hear a seagull, that's when you're going to get the sea longing. So he took that. He understood it. He was still a long way from the sea at the time, um, but they got closer and closer to the sea. Oh, um, and then he did hear a seagull. And from that moment, he has changed. He, uh, There are a couple of moments in the story where he has to just go off on his own for a little while just to um, you know, stop his heart beating so fast because he's just thinking about going on a boat to the sea. Um, and that gets triggered like that the moment he hears a seagull. Um, let's go to, um, Martin Sjöstrand, um, with a clarification for, this is a question that I answered a couple of weeks ago. Um, 
saying when I asked about the Great Plague the other week, um, there wasn't enough room to make myself clear. Chat messages, etc., are limited in length. Yeah, and I apologize, I'm very aware they are, and sometimes I'm sure I misinterpret them. Um, uh, when I implied that Sauron might have wanted to spare his allies from the plague, I didn't mean that he would care if they died in droves. I'm well aware that he's evil. I simply meant that it might bother him that the, that with them being hit so hard, it would save Gondor. Yeah, so this is, um, I, I would agree with all of that. Um, this is going back to sort of partway through the Third Age. And Sauron is slowly coming back, but... Uh, he's got a problem which is we've got a couple of these kingdoms of humans who are incredibly strong and they have institutional memory of sauron so he gets rid of arnor the witch king gets rid of arnor down south we've got gondor gondor at the time they were set up very much to keep an eye on Mordor. You can see it. If you just imagine the films when you're Minas Tirith, you look off in the distance, there's Mordor. And they set up watchtowers and castles all the way around the outside of Mordor. Um, Minas Morgul, that great castle, that was originally one of Minas Tirith, one of their castles that was just looking at Mordor to make sure Sauron never returned. Then this plague came. And suspiciously, it seemed to come from the direction of Sauron, and it swept across the land. It swept across um, sort of the Easterlands, the uh, Ravanian, down into Gondor, then moved on up, um, eventually even got as far as places uh, around where the Shire was. Um, this decimated Gondor, and it was this that... Um, made Gondor pull back from its historic role of just keeping an eye on Mordor. They abandoned their watchtowers. They just simply no, how, no longer had the people. Um, it wasn't a lack of will so much as a lack of uh, uh, human power to be just standing there watching. So we're told, Tolkien specifically says this in, I think it's in the appendices uh, to the Lord of the Rings, that uh if this had just hit Gondor, then Sauron's allies could have taken Gondor out there and then. That Gondor was so weakened by this plague that, that it, their enemies could have just wiped them off of the board in that moment. However, the plague was, it went everywhere and it damaged um, Gondor's enemies as well. And that meant that they did not have the strength to then attack Gondor. So, um, yeah, it's the, the situation seems to be that Sauron wanted the win that Gondor would pull back from their watching over a Mordor, and that was the way he was going to do it. And if that meant killing some of his own people, that was fine. It was never an option that at that point they were going to destroy Gondor completely. So what he wanted to do was weaken Gondor. Um, Marali saying uh, Legolas was the son of Thranduil, um, but who was his mother? We don't know. And this is one of the things, I mean, Tolkien is... Uh, we have to be honest, he's not always the best at mentioning mothers and wives' names um, or women's names more broadly. I mean, don't get me wrong, he had some astonishingly strong and brilliant women um, in his narratives. Uh, Eowyn, um, Luthien, incredible characters, and uh, very much against the kind of like stereotype of, of who who should be doing what at the time that Tolkien was writing those stories. But he often, when giving people's ancestries, did not mention the, the woman, the mother. Um, so uh, we don't know. And we don't know who Orifer was married to either. Um, Carrie Summers saying, um, I find it really intriguing um, how little we get to know about Legolas in the books. So much is influence, in, uh, inference, but he's more of a mystery than Gimli or Boromir. This came up when talking about Gimli, but could Legolas have thrown the ring into the fire? 
Um, so could Legolas have thrown the ring into the fire? What would the ring have tempted him with? Um, he seems less ambition even than Samwise. Um, his gift from her was arguably the least impressive. It was a magnificent bow, but he'd got a good one already. Um, so what's sort of going on here? I mean, I've kind of answered the what would it, the rim, ring have tempted him with, but this interesting one of whether you should have given the ring to Legolas. Maybe I should write a video on that. I did one on should you give the ring to Gimli, but should you give it to Legolas? Um, there's no reason to think that Legolas would have been any more... Uh, able to resist the ring than any other elf. Uh, by which we mean that Galadriel, she was tempted and she resisted the ring when Frodo offered it to her, but she had not known whether she would be able to. She is. She like pats herself on the back afterwards. So I have passed the test. Well done, me. I did it. I didn't didn't know whether I'd be able to do it. I didn't know whether I'd be able to resist. That's the feel from Gladriel after her millennia long character arc that started out with pride and a desire to rule lands and people, and it ends with this humility and love and care that allows her to resist the power of the ring. Where is Legolas? Well, he doesn't seem to have that um, incredible lust for power that perhaps someone like Galadriel did, but he definitely he has his weaknesses. He's um, he's not perfect, and anyone and if you were to compare elves and dwarves, we're told specifically that dwarves. Um, Sauron didn't understand how dwarf minds work. He he didn't quite get it. And so when he gave the rings of power to the dwarves, he couldn't control them because he didn't... Th th their minds worked differently to how he was expecting. Elves, th the implications that he could have done. He could have controlled the elves um, through the ring. That was certainly what the intention was. Um, so, and but the elves took off the rings that they had when they discovered what had been going on. So I don't think there's any reason to think that he would have succeeded in a way that Gimli wouldn't have done. Um, as for the gift he gets, yeah, I agree. It's not that impressive, but we do see it in action and do recognize that from that moment on, he might have said, oh yeah, he's a cool archer, but he's that he's shooting down, um, uh, fell beasts from the sky. He's he's. I mean, even yes, he lost his little uh, challenge against Gimli, but forty-one um, orcs. He was a, an astonishing figure at uh, the Battle of Helmsteep. He was he was one. You know, if you were playing a tabletop Warhammer game or something like that, he would be a lot of points because he was destroying elves in their droves. Um, Martin S. saying, was Castamir's uh, usurpation of the throne of Gondor in any way instigated or driven on by the agents of Sauron? Or was that story just what you see at face value? I lean towards face value in this case. Yeah, so there were um, uh, three um, big um, things that happen in Gondor, which weakened Gondor. This is, we talked about the plague already. We got the attack of the Wayne Riders, uh, who basically were Easterlings who came in and um, were very impressive in attacking Gondor. Here we have uh, the third, where basically we get an internecine struggle. Uh, we get uh, uh, rival claimants to the throne and um, Gondor splits. Uh, it does has some infighting and then it splits. Um, so was that just one of those things or was that on Sauron's instigation? Well, perhaps Sauron, when we're not told. Uh, but yeah, I think my instinct is that it feels like this is just one of those things. The idea that Gon Gondor could have survived all that time without at least one 
power struggle. Um, I, I don't quite believe that. Um, let's go to a question from um, Mara Lee. Tolkien wrote that there was an ancient quarrel between elves and dwarves. However, Legolas and Gimli were eventually able to move past that and become friends. Um, in writing about their relationship as friends, do you think Tolkien was trying to teach us something? Well, I think this comes to the heart of what, how Tolkien wrote and what he was trying to write, how he was trying to write. If you look at the, or if you read the introduction, his introduction to The Lord of the Rings, He's um, very clear and strong that he he dislikes cordially dislikes allegory allegory in all of its forms. Um, he did not want to teach things with the stories that he told. He wanted what he thought what he called applicability. Now that means, as with myth that we can have a story and then it, in each day and age we can take truths from that for ourselves so um and a very sort of strict way of saying this was he trying to teach us about friendship no i don't think he would want that i don't think that was his intention however undoubtedly themes are there in tolkien's work um themes like hope thing themes like caring for the environment around us and themes like friendship come through again and again this isn't the only great friendship we have in Tolkien if you go back into the Silmarillion which let's not forget all of that uh, earlier legendarium that was in his view that was his life's work the Lord of the Rings was just a story which came off from that. And um, friendship is one of these key themes. And we should see, we almost always see with friendship in Tolkien's world, this is positive. This brings great things. So is he trying to teach us? No. But I think he's trying to show us and then allow us to draw our own conclusions, which sounds like a, a kind of techie nuance, but I, I think it's it's quite an important one. Kaya Spellerine is saying, would bearing or using the ring tie you to Middle-earth and prevent sea longing, or would an elf try to take it with them to Valinor? <coughs> um, well, uh, it's quite a conceptual question. If So if an elf had the one ring that ultimately would bring about in whatever shape or form it is a lust for power and that means yourself being in charge of a thing that doesn't seem to be so much what is the feel over in Valinor so I I think that um if you got the one ring if you were an elf if you got the one ring in middle earth then um you wouldn't want to maybe eventually you would get like ideas above your station and say well i want to go over and invade there as well but to start with i think you just wouldn't want to you want to be on middle earth where you can have the things that you want um kelly summers side question Gloin was at the Council of Elrond. Yes, he was. So Tolkien would have probably included Legolas in The Hobbit in a rewrite, but I don't recall any interaction or reconciliation between Legolas and Gloin. Even with Gimli, they had a great bond, um, but they never really addressed the issues that had divided them. No, it's true. It's, um, it's almost left for us as a reader to read between the lines here that Gloin was there he was one of the dwarves in the hobbit that thranduil legolas is dead and that dad and legolas himself who was the prince at the time imprisoned unfairly from definitely from the dwarf perspective and so and let's not forget 
uh, Thranduil's plan was he was going to capture them there. Then when he discovered that um, the uh, Dragon Smaug was dead, he went off and tried to claim some of the gold for himself. Not his gold, he just wanted the gold. So um, we know how dwarves feel about their gold, and if somebody wanted, somebody kidnapped them, uh, almost prevented them from getting where they needed to be by the time they needed to be. Let's not forget it was a very time critical thing. They needed to be there at a particular date in order for the key to work. Um, and then tried to take their gold without even knowing whether the dwarves had survived. Yeah, they they have a legitimate concern there. With do does this play out? not hugely in the Council of Elrond. We're left to know and understand this, but um, I think Tolkien was wary of drawing too many links across between The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. But they, were, they were written in different styles to different audiences, The Hobbit being very much a children's book, The Lord of the Rings not so much. Um, and it almost could have been a distraction at that point in the text when they're talking about um what are we going to do with the ring it's actually it's really it takes quite a while going through the council of Elrond, but it's a really tightly constructed ongoing conversation here's all the history of where we've got to right now here's you know here's the different options of what we could do this is therefore what we're going to do it flows and I suspect if suddenly in the midst of that we get uh, Gloin saying, hang on a moment, I've just realised who you are. You're the guy who imprisoned me. That would take us out completely. So I think from a literary perspective, I completely understand. I, the, the kind of implication has to be that maybe they had a few words and agreed to um, put aside their differences for the time being. Um, because there was a higher cause that they needed to be dealing with. That that seems to be what we've got going on there. Um, uh, okay, we've got... Actually, that's the last of my questions about um, uh, the Lord of the Rings issues more broadly, but Legolas in particular. If you have another question, now is the right time uh, to drop it into the chat. I will try and pick up as many of them as I can. I do have another question from one of my patrons. Um, which is more on the Song of Ice and Fire question, which I'll get to. Um, let's get, have a quick flick through. Um, Carl Karsnock doing, uh, oh, happily quoting the introduction to the Lord of the Rings that I was sort of, uh, I'm sure, horribly misquoting. Um, I cordially dislike allegory in any of its manifestations and always have done since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence, says Tolkien. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied ap applicability to the thought and experience of readers. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author. So yeah, that was, that's his feeling. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to teach he, he wants the reader to come to the text and then draw their own conclusions from it. Um, yeah, the, the freedom of the reader as opposed to the purposed domination of the author. Uh, Martin S. saying the nouns Ainu, Vaya, and Maya are made plural by adding the letter um, R at the end. Uh, yes. That is unlike the typical English convention of adding S at the end for a plural, rather sim similar to Swedish. Um, yes, uh, I would agree. I mean, I, I, Tolkien was a student and a master at more than just English. Um, and a lot of his, um, the words that he used came from, not just Old English, but also some Celtic, but a lot of Norse, Nordic, Germanic languages as well. So, um, yeah, the the, uh, the fact that um, the way he pluralizes some things sounds more Scandinavian than English should not, I think, be a surprise. But, yeah, that's a, a really good observation. Thank you very much. Um 
Uh, Octane saying, did Tolkien serve alongside overseas soldiers? I mean, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. This is a World War One question. He did. Um, <coughs> I'm sure he came across them while he was uh, over in Belgium. But the way that they recruited um, back in in the UK anyway in uh, World War One was that they tried to encourage groups of friends to recruit together they would try and get a group of people and say okay you're now a company or whatever um get some kind of local pride going on with a group of people and then then get and station them all together um and so tolkien will have been based with people from his area people that he knew um yes he will have come into contact with others um and he did travel more widely as he got older as well. Um, but uh, yeah, his particular local group was made up of local people. Um, right, let's go to uh, oh, Caius Bellarina saying, did anyone ask about his hair color? Uh, what is it? Um, uh, right, this is an interesting question. Um, I do have... Uh, just in front of me i've got a description of him i can't actually see um whether he's got a hair color in that description um oh that's interesting um because we in our minds he clearly has this very blonde hair but this is this is the description we have this is what tolkien wrote um well this is in the book of lost tales so this is um his scribblings is probably underplaying it, but uh, this is one of the earliest collections that uh, Christopher Tolkien uh, had of his wider writings. He was tall as a young tree, lithe, immensely strong, able swiftly to draw a great pardon me, able swiftly to draw a great war bow and shoot down a Nazgul endowed with the tremendous vitality of elvish bodies, so hard and resistant to hurt that he went only in light shoes over rock or through snow, the most tireless of all the fellowship. Um, so uh, that's that's the little description. And that, that he wrote that in response to uh, um, a, a critique uh, of... Uh, Legolas, I don't know, critiques the quite the right word that sort of suggested that he was um, rather sort of slim, and I think the word was ladylike. Um, that was not what he was intending. He was intending for him to have a quite a strong, muscular body. Um, so, although yes, Orlando Bloom definitely looked the part. I don't think that was exactly what came to mind. I think he was taller. I think he was more muscly than uh, Orlando Bloom was. Um, uh, Kelly Summers saying, just want to give uh, another shout out to the mods. Yes, absolutely. I also should do a shout out to my patrons, which I always try to do. Uh, patrons, thank you. Um, I hugely appreciate your support. This is how um, I uh, I survive as a content creator um, and also uh, why I try and prioritize questions for my patrons. If you do want to uh, support uh, in Deep Geek, um, then the best way to do that is through Patreon. There is a link if you're watching live. There will be a link appearing wherever your um, chat is, uh, live chat. If you're watching back a little bit later, then down in the description there will be a link. But it's in Deep Geek. Uh, sorry, it's patreon.com slash in Deep Geek. Um, uh, username redacted saying any idea for an actor or actors to play legolas at a younger or older time period of his life i think older no because i don't think he really uh, i mean he's only around in in elf terms for not you know, only a few years not very long after uh, the lord of the rings before he heads off to valinor um as for a younger actor, I'm always terrible at this, um, I'll be honest. So I will allow people in the chat a chance to say uh, if they've got any ideas of who might play a young Legolas. Because um, we do, uh, there's a possibility we might see a young Legolas at some point or a, 
another Legolas from around the same time period. We have, this is just a reminder of the rights, which are very complicated, but Amazon holds the rights to make TV shows, plural, from the material that they have. Um, they obviously have one going, the Rings of Power, but if they think that's a massive success and they want to do others, then they have the right to do that. Warner Brothers slash New Line Cinema also have the right to make more films. Um, so it's entirely possible we could see, I mean, people always do it as the default, oh, well, we'll probably have Young Aragorn. It's entirely, yeah, that makes sense. Young Aragorn is probably the most obvious thing they could go for, but they could go for other things. So, yeah, it's possible we could get Young Legolas. As for casting, though, I'm always terrible about that, so um, I'm not going to um, get into that one. Having a quick... Uh, uh, look through here. My, I'll do my question about my Song of Ice and Fire question. Nate Davis saying, what is your theory on what causes the long night? Um, I think that for me, it's it's quite it's quite straightforward, really. The, um, the, there are two elements to this in the world of Game of Thrones. The first is the seasons, and the seasons were put out of kilter um, out, out of balance by, and this is on the back cover of the very first edition we had of the very first book, so this is what George R. R. Martin was initially wanting us to know, uh, by a preternatural um, magical event in way back in the past. So that's what has made everything wrong. Um, I suspect that that event was the creation or the introduction in some way of the other's the others have an ability to bring with them, uh, yes, there might be winter around them, but they bring with them cold. They bring the winter with them. They're magical creatures. And so when there are many of them and when they're heading south and when they're not opposed by people, they will bring, and if it's at winter time already, they will bring a long night because they are shifting the weather and the climate as a whole. That's that's my general theory on what it is. It's when they move. That's the way the causality goes. Um, Martin S. saying, do you think Legolas is older or younger than Elrond and Calabrian's children, Eladan, Elrohir, and Arwen? Um... I mean, I think they're roughly of the same generation. Um, so, uh, off the top of my head, we have so Ar uh, Elrond meets um, their mother in the second age, marries her early in the third age. Um, I can't remember exactly when Arwen was born, uh, but they, they're all in the early first half of the Third Age, those three were born. That is my instinct for probably when um, uh, Legolas was born as well, roughly around that. Um, okay, I think uh, with that, I'm going to uh, start drawing this one to a close. We have got... Uh, coming up next, we have got a couple more live streams uh, based on the series we were doing going through the Targaryen Kings, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire um, ones for the next couple of weeks. Um, so we have Eris the First and Makar the First, both of which I think are not very well known and understood Targaryen Kings. If we have the whole list in front of us, um, there are many more famous, but they're both really intriguing characters if you go back into the history to try and understand who they are. So that's what's coming up for the next couple of weeks on the live stream. I've got um, videos coming out um, hopefully now at twice, twice a week. Uh, we've got uh, videos coming out. I've got one on The Witcher Season 3 Part 1 coming out at some point quite soon. Um, so if you're into that, uh, then uh, you might like that. Um, yeah, and also a couple um, 
of new collaborations with History of Westeros, looking at the Red Wedding and Roos Bolton's master plan. If you've ever wondered what actually is his plan, what's he trying to do, um, uh, then we will be answering that one for you. Okay, so um, that's enough for this time. I will be back same time next week. If you are watching this back a little bit later, there will be a link appearing somewhere around here to more of these live streams, and there will be a link appearing somewhere around here to my Patreon, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. That's all for this time. Take care, everyone, and I'll see you again.